Hey everybody, Mr. Toad here. Welcome back to another flipped lesson. And in this lesson, we're gonna be talking about respiratory emergencies. So a really important uh, set of emergencies and many different things that can happen that affect your breathing. Uh, and we know that's one of the key ABCs there to keeping our patients alive. So really important stuff. Uh, as we go through this flipped lesson, here's your list of objectives and key terms. So definitely make sure you know these. Um, if you don't, if you have any questions at the end of the lesson, uh, go on back, take a look and make sure you know them. All right, so let's quick do a, qu uh, a quick little reminder of the anatomy and physiology for our really our airway, right? So we're talking about breathing um, in terms of right, our ABCs. B is for breathing. A is for airway. Um, and that breathing really, we can think of it as ventilation, right? The mechanical and physiological mechanisms where the lungs take oxygen from the air and expel carbon dioxide. So we've referenced A, airway, for the way that air gets into our lungs and breathing, B, or ventilation, we can think of as a more scientific term, is how we get that oxygen in here, get it into our bloodstream to go around to all of our cells that need it and get rid of that carbon dioxide. And we can actually break the airway uh, into two parts, right? We have the upper airway here where the trachea comes up into the larynx, the oropharynx, nasopharynx. We've talked about that way back in our airway chapter. Uh, and really a lot of what we're going to look at today is the lower airway. All right, we have your trachea coming down into the bronchioles and those get smaller and smaller as it goes into your lungs and eventually you get these little bronchiole, bronchioles right here we we're talking about, these little stems that come off. And then you have the alveoli, right, which are those little air sacs, the smallest little air sacs in your lungs that fill up with the air you breathe in. And you could see wrapped around all these alveoli are blood vessels, red for artery, blue for veins, okay? And that's where the oxygen exchange takes place, right? Uh, if you remember way back to your science class, it has to do with diffusion. So there's less oxygen in your deoxygenated blood returning to the lungs than there is in the air sacs, the alveoli. So the oxygen diffuses from the air sacs into the blood and the carbon dioxide diffuses from the blood back into your air sac to get expelled out. And that's a quick little recap there of breathing. So we talk about um, air, right? We're breathing in air and air is actually 78% nitrogen. So mostly nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and then a mixture of other gases, helium, carbon dioxide, all types of stuff um, uh, as well. So we think about, and I know we talked about being able to do rescue breathing, right? Which we're not doing right now with COVID, um, but you could breathe into somebody else and they could survive off that for a shorter period of time. And the reason that is, is because there's 21% oxygen in atmospheric air. And we use about nine-ish percent um, with every breath we take. So every time we exhale, we have about 11% and um, from that 21. So that's enough for somebody to survive on. So that's why we're able to do rescue breathing. And something just to think about here, um, I mean, there's many different times in your day, in your life, where you might have different respiratory rates, right? Right now on the couch, uh, except for my talking, I should have a pretty normal respiration rate, somewhere between 12 and 20 breaths per minute, which we'll talk about in a few slides here. Um, but you're, you're going to start breathing more if you go to do exercise, right? If you go for a walk, a jog, a run, a swim, um, your body's using more oxygen, so it needs to get more oxygen. So how does it actually control that? Well, it actually doesn't have to do with the amount of oxygen. It has to do with the amount of carbon dioxide, all right? So as your body uses oxygen and produces CO2, that returns in your bloodstream to your lungs to get exhaled. Um, and your body has special sensors in your circulatory system that detects how much CO2 is there because carbon dioxide is actually acidic. So the more acidic your blood is, the lower the pH, which actually causes you to breathe more. All right, so it increases your respiratory rate until your carbon dioxide levels go back down. Um, and then you'll start to breathe less. So that's how we control our breathing, right? It's really based on the amount of carbon dioxide. And this can actually be affected in some patients, as we'll talk about our COPDers in a minute, where they actually lose that respiratory drive if we were to give them too much oxygen. All right, so how do we assess breathing, right? We learned just a brief recap of the anatomy. So how do we assess breathing, right? Well, there's four big things we need to talk about and then some uh, other uh, really important stuff, but but I want to talk about these four for four first, right? Because you don't need any tools really to 
assess these. So rate, rhythm, quality, and depth. And we've talked about these. We talked about them already when we did our patient assessment chapter, but let's just review them real quick. So rate, right? How many times are you taking a breath in each minute? 12 to 20 breaths per minute is normal for the average person at rest. Um, but we can be really far outside those ranges where you're actually not getting enough oxygen. So for example, if you're bre breathing less than eight breaths per minute, that's not adequate, okay? If you're breathing more than 30 breaths per minute as an adult, that's not adequate. And you can see this chart here, right? We, we've talked about how different age groups uh, have different vital signs. So again, the adults, puberty and up 12 to 20. But right, if you're down, if you're a six month old, you might be breathing 24 or 30 breaths per minute. That's normal, right? We've talked about that with our infant CPR and uh, rescue breathing, okay? However, if an adult was breathing 30 breaths per minute, that would, uh, that would cause some uh, scary moments there, right? We want to figure out what's going on. Uh, so rhythm, is it regular or is it irregular, right? Normal breathing is regular every couple seconds uh, on those couple seconds. So every five to six seconds, right? It's going to get you that 12 breaths per minute. If you go, <laughs> right, irregular, that's not good. Um, quality and depth, right? So when we talk about quality, we're actually talking about, do we hear any sounds, Okay. Um, what are we listening to? We're going to auscultate, right? That word, use our stethoscope to listen. And um, well, I'm going to play some lung sounds here in a minute, but what does it sound like, right? Good, normal breathing, actually really quiet. You can't hear it. But So if you hear funky sounds, I mean, something bad's going on. And then depth, right? We want a nice full and equal chest rise. We've talked about that uh, a whole bunch of times. So this is normal breath sounds. Let's listen to this. If you listen carefully, you should hear just some nice quiet breathing. And it keeps playing there. All right, so let's do this one now, which is, I believe this is either wheezing or ronchi. Let's listen. And you can hear how abnormal uh, that sounds, right? Really not good. And one more here. All right, so you can just hear those other two, the ronchi and the wheezing, how congested it sounds, how liquidy, um, really just not clear at all, and that's not good. So there's actually tons of different types of breath sounds out there, and if you hear anything that's not normal, that's something we're going to be concerned. Uh, as you get further into your field of medicine, you'll be able to identify the many different types, which would help you figure out what's going on, but for our basic EMS level. We just want to know, does it sound nice and clear and regular, or is there something funky going on? All right, so those are our big four. And again, we really don't need anything to um, assess rate, rhythm, quality, and depth besides our eyes, a stethoscope. And for a lot of those times, you don't even need a stethoscope. You can just listen for wheezing or funny sounds uh, and a watch, right, to do door vital. So let's talk about some other things, which uh, are definitely newer types of technology, but help us really get a good grasp for what's going on for the patient. So pulse oximetry, right? We've talked about that before in patient assessment. It measures how much the oxygen saturation uh, of the blood cells that are flowing around your body. And we said greater than 94% is normal, okay? Um, usually most people are going to be anywhere from 96 or 97% up to 99 to 100. That's good. Um, if you're a little bit lower, that's okay. But above 94 is normal. So as we get lower than 94%, we start to get more concerned, especially as we get really low into the 80s, 70s, 60s, all the way down to the 40s, 30s, all right? And again, that's that little device we put on the finger. It reads the color of the red blood cells, to figure out how much oxygen it will usually give us a pulse to. And we can see here, this person's at 93% oxygen saturation. So pulse ox is a really good tool and it's, and it's great because it's so tiny now. When the devices first came out, they're so much bigger. But as soon as we start talking to a patient, I pop it right on their finger just so we can see what's going on. Um, so another one which we have not talked about yet, which is really cool stuff, is called end, and I actually misspelled it here, it's end title, capnography, all right? So capnography is this really cool technique which ALS is going to carry, um, but it actually what measures how much carbon dioxide is exhaled. So whereas pulse oximetry is measuring 
the oxygen levels. Capnography is measuring the, the carbon dioxide levels. And um, it's really cool, right? Because remember we said our respiratory drive is based on carbon dioxide. So by measuring how much carbon dioxide uh, is coming out with each breath, we can see how our patient's doing. And it's measured in millimeters of mer mercury, just like blood pressure, okay? And you can see here, this is waveform capnography. So you want it to be, I can't read the number here. It's kind of small. I think that's 35, right? We see these nice square uh, rhythms. So as you exhale, it comes up, it hits that peak. And then when the patient inhales, it drops down to zero because they're getting lots of oxygen, right? Exhale. And that's going to help us uh, determine how well they're breathing, right? If we see really low CO2, that means they're not exhaling enough. Sometimes we'll see things called shark fins where it's not a flat expiration, right? They're having trouble getting out that CO2. So that's a really good tool for us to see how the patient's breathing. And that's uh, something that ALS is going to carry. And then again, we can't forget about our good old signs uh, of difficulty breathing, right? So tachypnea, tachy means fast breathing, so really rapid. Bradypnea or brady, right, is a prefix. Bradypnea is slow breathing. Cyanosis, we've talked about that uh, when you're turning blue. Right, you're not getting enough oxygen. Nasal flaring. Right, you're breathing so hard, your nostrils open up. Sitting in that up, uh, upright or tripod position. I got a picture in a slide here. And then, of course, changes in mental status is a huge one because if you're not getting enough oxygen, right, your brain is going to start to not function properly. They're going to have a change in mental status. They won't be have avpu. They won't be alert to person, place, time, and event. All right, so. What are some of our more common respiratory emergencies? So we'll start with some of the more common ones, right? So asthma, also known as bronchospasm. I'm sure some of you may be asthmatics. Um, we really don't know actually what causes asthma yet. Uh, there's lots of different factors that go into it, environmental, genetic. But we know that asthma is a respiratory disease where you have sudden lower airway, so those bronchioles down here, constriction and increased mu mucus production. So basically when you have an asthma attack, um, your bronchioles down here start to constrict, they get really mucousy, and it's just so hard to move air in and out. Um, and you can see this picture here of those airways tightening up. And when you tighten up, you can't get new oxygen in, and you can't get that CO2 out. So really dangerous emergency. We see it in all types of age groups, um, and we'll talk about how to treat this in a minute. So a more common one for our older patients is COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And that's inflammation of or lung disease, right, where it constricts the bronchi that um, carry in and air in and out of the lungs. And the big difference between this and asthma, a lot of times we'll see them coincide in patients. Um, but asthma is that chronic. A lot of times you get it when you're younger. You could have sports-induced asthma, whereas COPD is going to be a much older patient. Um, you usually not, maybe not much older, but, and usually a lot of times we have is our smokers, right? So maybe someone in your family, your grandparent was a smoker back in the day. They have that real raspy voice, uh, really trouble breathing. They might be on supplemental oxygen, just like this guy here, right? Really skinny, um, lots of chest movement, trying to breathe. That's COPD. And, uh, that's a chronic disease, right? That's never going to go away. You're always going to struggle with that versus an asthma, you'll have an attack, you'll have an episode, and hopefully you'll get better from that um, after a few minutes. Some other complications we may see from COPD, as well as just on their own, will be bronchitis and emphysema. So bronchitis is the swelling of those bronchioles down there. Um, emphysema actually takes place in the alveoli, those little air sacs. You can see the picture at the bottom here. Normally, they're all nice and puffed up, um, nice and puffy, so air can come in and out. And with emphysema, they get all saggy and kind of deflated. They're all damaged. So much harder to get that oxygen and that carbon dioxide, that good air exchange at the alveoli level. Uh, another one here is called a pulmonary embolism. And that is where we have a blood clot that actually gets stuck in the pulmonary artery. So that's the artery that leaves the heart to go to the lungs to get new oxygen. And blood clots come from, you know, eating too many eight for eights at Wendy's where you're Arteries clog up, you sit on the couch all day doing Zoom and Google Meet meetings with your teachers, and you get all this plaque and gross stuff that builds up in your veins, sometimes called deep vein thrombosis. And you get these little blockages, right, that build up. They might break loose. And a lot of times, maybe you've seen an older relative or an older person with these like purplish gray legs like this down here. Um, they can break loose a lot of times out of the legs because they're not moving, there's not good blood flow. They flow all the way up and they get stuck in the heart or in the pulmonary artery. 
um, causing a blockage. And that can cause real difficulty breathing because you're not able to get new oxygen for that blood that's flowing to the lungs. All right, some other common respiratory emergencies here. One of my favorites, pneumothorax, AKA a collapsed lung. Um, and we talked a little bit about this a few weeks ago with uh, sucking chest wounds, right? And flail chest and those lung injuries where we said you can actually start to collapse the lung, whether it's a hole to the chest or a hole inside the lung. And that's an acute, so really it's accumulation of uh, air between the lung and the inner chest wall. So it's called the pleural space here, right? This right outside here would be your rib cage. I mean, you can see a lot of times it comes from like a popped lung, like a hole in here. It can come from an exterior wound, right? A sucking chest wound. But essentially this space fills with air. Um, oops, sorry, let me go back. And that starts to compress the lung. And that's, and we talked about that with sucking chest wounds, right? That's bad because air is supposed to come in through here, through the trachea, all right? And when it doesn't come through the trachea, it doesn't go into the lungs to get absorbed into your bloodstream. When it's in this chest wall, it does nothing. So that's a pneumothorax, collapsed lung. And, and again, there's many different reasons for pneumothorax, okay? It could be traumatic. Um, sometimes they'll just pop on their own. Could be overexertion, many different ways. Um, so another one here, and I don't have a picture of it, but CHF or congestive heart failure. Again, we see this in a lot of older, sicker patients where basically their heart is really starting to um, slow down, not be as effective. And one of the main jobs of our heart is not only for moving our blood around, it's also to keep our fluid moving around. So when you have a weak heart, fluid starts to get absorbed everywhere and it can actually back up into your lungs um, and your pulmonary artery there. And it can actually make it hard to breathe, like really hard to breathe because you have this big backup, right? Imagine you're trying to drive to the mall on Black Friday and all the cars are backed up. Well, if you can't get in, everything's gonna take super long. You're gonna have trouble driving. Same thing with that congestive heart failure. All that fluid backs up in your lungs and now you can't breathe. All right, I would be remiss if we didn't talk about COVID-19 this year. Um, and again, we, we've heard so much about it. We know so much about it, um, right? It's a, we, we're, we're, well, at the same time, we're still learning so much about it, right? We know it affects the respiratory system. We believe it has something to do with that really small level, the alveoli where um, the arteries and veins, right, connect to those alveoli like we looked at in one of these pictures. In this picture, oh my goodness, in this picture right here, right, we think COVID-19 has something to do with that. And that's why we're seeing complications with uh, strokes and cardiac issues, not just respiratory, even though respiratory is the number one killer from COVID-19. Again, for this, we're looking for your fevers, your shortness of breath, coughing, um, as well as your exposure, so one might have it. And then finally, just kind of the catch-all, right? So we had, we, we listed a whole bunch of reasons that our respiratory emergencies that we might treat differently, especially in the emergency room, right? Um, when we get to the hospital, but just in general, difficulty breathing. So we have these two pages of issues that happen. We got to remember, sometimes people just might have trouble breathing because they're having trouble breathing. It may not be any of these. Could be from trauma, right? If you get hurt in the chest real hard, it's going to be difficult to breathe. A head injury we talked about with brain bleeds could affect your breathing rates, all right? A stroke, diabetic emergency, just remember, anything can cause difficulty breathing. And that's why I go back to this right here, right? Um, when we're assessing our breathing, we're looking for rate, rhythm, quality, and depth. And for every patient, that's why breathing is step number two in A, B, C, right? B, breathing. We need to look at every patient and see how they're breathing because for us as EMS professionals, I mean, it's great if we could figure out what's going on, but we need to be able to say, hey, if they're not breathing correctly, we need to help them out. All right. So that's all of our many common respiratory emergencies. Oh, and I meant to put this on the other slide. You can see this is cyanosis here, right? This woman's fingers are turning blue, right? They're not getting enough oxygen. So we're looking at blueness. All right. So how do we treat some of these respiratory emergencies, right? We learned the anatomy. We learned some of the bigger ones and what to look for. Now, how do we treat them? All right. So treatment of a respiratory emergency, uh, it's really centered on improving the patient's overall oxygenation. So how do we help them get more oxygen to all the cells of their body? And obviously, right, think about it again, go back to our patient assessment, A, B, C, A is for airway. So you can't have good breathing if your airway is not open and clear. So remembering OSO, right, open the airway for unconscious, suction anything out, put in an airway adjunct or intubate if we have to, making sure the airway is good because if you don't have an airway, you can't breathe. 
All right. For our conscious patient, I would say our next biggest thing is the position of comfort. And you can see this woman here, she's on home oxygen and she's doing that tripoding position, right? Holding herself up. If a patient's having difficulty breathing, they are absolutely 100% not going to want to go to lay down. All right. So when you lay down, it becomes so much harder to breathe. Your organs from your belly push up and push on your lungs. It's, uh, any fluid in your lungs now covers all of your lungs instead of just the bottom. So we want to try and keep our patients sitting up if they can. They're going to want to themselves. All right. Probably our next best way to help a somebody having difficulty breathing is to use supplemental oxygen. Um, and again, we want to do this if their uh, oxygen saturation, right, using our pulse ox is less than 94%. Um, we can actually hurt the patient if they have good oxygenation and we just give them oxygen. It's actually not good. But if they're less than 94%, we could give them supplemental oxygen. And that's with these green canisters here, right? So oxygen tanks are always green. They're always going to have two prongs we put our regulator in. Um, and basically, it's 100% oxygen in here, up to 2,000 pounds per square inch of oxygen, so quite a bit. And we have some different ways we can give a patient oxygen. And we used to just slap the biggest one on, the non-rebreather here, and let it go to town. But again, we learned that giving oxygen to somebody who doesn't need it is not necessarily good. Same thing like backboarding we talked about, right? So if you have somebody at like 91% SpO2, like they're just on the cusp, I'd probably start with this first thing, right? The nasal cannula. And you've all seen that. This guy's got it. It's the two little prongs that go up into your nose. And those are going to run really low, right? Two to six liters per minute. Um, and you'll the patient will get about, instead of that 21% oxygen on the air, they'll get about anywhere from 30 to 40%. And for those people who have an SpO2 of in the low 90s, that might just be enough to help get them up a little bit. All right. For somebody that's breathing on their own but really having trouble, we're going to move up to the non-rebreather here. And we've looked at this in class. This bag fills up with oxygen. Every breath this person takes, they're going to get like 90% oxygen. So that's going to really help them. And again, that's if someone's really having trouble breathing. They're down into the 80s. We see, again, that, that rate, quality, depth, right? If they're really having trouble, cyanosis, breathing really fast, that will hopefully help them get more oxygen to slow down their breathing. And then finally, if somebody's not breathing at all, right, or they're breathing so fast or so slow it's not adequate, so like four breaths a minute or like 40 breaths a minute, we're going to use that bag valve mask that we talked about in CPR, right, as you see right here. Hook it up to oxygen at 15 liters per minute, um, and we're going to give a squeeze every five to six seconds and try and breathe for that patient, okay? So giving oxygen is really one of the biggest, probably the most common way we help people having difficulty breathing besides position of comfort. Now, going back to the uh, to asthma attacks, right, bronchospasm, um, uh, and for those of you who have asthma, I'm sure you all have one of these down here, an inhaler, right, or an MDI, a meter dose inhaler, and that gives the drug albuterol, right, which is a bronchodilator. It opens up our bronchioles to try and help that asthmatic breathe a little bit easier. So most patients who have asthma are going to have their inhaler, and chances are when we get there on the ambulance, they're going to have puffed it like 10 times already, and they're only supposed to do two or three. All right, so it works sometimes, sometimes it doesn't work, depending on how bad their asthma attack is. So we can help somebody with an inhaler, and it has to be their inhaler, it has to be the right date, can't be expired, um, and we can help them do it if they have it there. But again, most patients are going to do that. If they don't have their inhaler, or they haven't used all of it, as EMTs, and I, and I put our state protocol in here so you could take a look, we could do what's called a nebulizer treatment um, and we actually call it a duo neb because we actually give two medications, right? That albuterol sulfate, um, which is similar to what is, or the same drug, I should say, that's in their inhaler, right? It's a vaso or a, a bronchodilator, opens up our bronchioles, uh, as well as this ipratropium bromide, right? Which helps with their breathing. Um, so it's a, it's called a nebulizer, and essentially we hook it up to the oxygen. And there's two ways you could do it: this T piece where you stick it in your mouth um, and breathe out in and out there. Uh, as well as a mask. And you can see on both these, there's this little green canister where we pour, this is a picture of it, right? Uh, the two meds, the albuterol and the petropium bromide into the little cup and the oxygen aerosolizes it and they breathe it in and breathe it out. And that's going to help open up their airways. All right. Um, this is our flow chart, right? I'm, I'm not going to go the whole through the whole thing, but basically they need to have a disease where they would have an inhaler. They need to have been diagnosed one already um, and we need, to, and they basically have to qualify for us to help them with it. All right. So, 
Um, that's a little flow chart there. This is a great tool to help patients have an asthma attacks to really settle down, open up their airway. But it's actually not something we're really doing with COVID right now. And that makes sense. It just sends aerosolized virus particles all over the place. Um, but we could do a nebulizer, all right? A duo neb for these two meds. Uh, and then a new one for the basic level, right? Paramedics have been doing this a while. This is a great one. And I actually did it for the first time uh, a couple months uh, this, this fall uh, on a CHF patient is called CPAP, all right? Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. And you may have heard of CPAP before, usually for your dad who really has trouble sleeping at night because he snores a lot and it pushes air down. But essentially a CPAP, it's not a ventilator, right? It's not going to breathe for a patient, but it will help them breathe. Okay, we use this for our obstructive airway patients, so our asthmatics, congestive heart failure, COPD, bronchitis. Um, and essentially what this does is it keeps their lungs inflated. So they're having really a lot of trouble to breathe and their lungs can actually get so deflated that it's too much work for them to open them back up. And essentially this helps push air and keep air in their lungs so that they can breathe on their own. If, they, if we didn't do this CPAP, um, we would actually have to ventilate them with a BVM and then probably be intubated uh, and whatnot. They're not breathing on their own. All right. And you can see, I'm, again, I'm not, I put up the state protocol for this here and it's cool because EMTs can finally do this now uh, and it's really, really helpful. But you can see there's a couple inclusions. So they, the patient must have this. They must be alert. They must be breathing. They may have trouble breathing, but they still have to be breathing. We can't put this on a patient who's not breathing. This will not breathe for the patient, but it will help them. Uh, and then you can see all these exclusions, right? So the patient can't have any of these. Uh, and some of the big ones would be like uh, decreased mental status. So they can't be unconscious. They can't have um, neck surgery in the past recent because there is putting pressure down there. All right. So again, uh, this CPAP machine, you can see it here. It's like bigger than a BVM. It straps really tight to their face. It's really uncomfortable. But after a few minutes, it will help the patient breathe. It kind of pushes that airway down. Um, we have this setting called a PEEP setting, which tells how much pressure. And you can actually do this with your, it's kind of cool. You could do the duo neb, right? The nebulizer for albuterol sulfate and impertropium bromide we talked about on the last slide with CPAP. You can see that little med canister right here. We put those in. So not only are they getting help breathing from the CPAP, they're getting the meds um, from the nebulizer too. It's like a two-in-one treatment. Pretty cool. So, hey guys, that's the end on respiratory emergencies, a lot of stuff. Make sure you go back, look at that first slide. If you don't know any of the words or objectives, go and rewatch it till you do. And uh, hey, smash that like button. We'll see you on the next one.